Well, hi there. Welcome back to Museum of America's Combat Helmets of the 20th Century. My name is Manny Gentili, and today we're going to talk about uh, how to conserve your helmets. That is to say, merely how to take care of and maintain the helmets in your collection. So we're going to talk about some simple techniques, some real basic, fundamental, common sense stuff. Uh, first, a little bit about my background. For 18 years, I worked at a very large Midwestern public museum. And while I was there, I curated and helped to conserve many military items. Items that included things like one of Robert E. Lee's sword sashes, a shoulder strap worn by George Armstrong Custer. And then we also had a wonderful veteran from that area named Jay Houston, who donated the helmet he wore during the Normandy invasion. So we had a lot of really cool stuff at the museum. It was really exciting because I got to handle it. Now, the job that I retired from recently was as a park ranger for the National Park Service. And during my tenure with the Park Service, when I was at Antietam National Battlefield, uh, we built a new museum, several new galleries. And during that time, I got to uh, curate and conserve, again, many military items, including the headquarters flag for uh, General George B. McClellan. That was quite a privilege. Now, the techniques that I use for conserving my helmets are the techniques used by the American Museum Association and the National Park Service. Good enough for them, good enough for me. Now, generally speaking, there are three ways that artifacts are dealt with. One is preservation, another is conservation, and the third is restoration. Now, preservation is really simple. Uh, you take the object, give it a light dusting, wrap it up in acid-free tissue, put it in an acid-free box, store it in a dark climate-controlled room, come back 50 years later, open the box, and there it is. It's being preserved. Another one is restoration. Restoration is pretty heavy-duty stuff. Uh, at the museum, we had a fire engine from the 1930s, and we wanted to be able to make it a hands-on experience for people, so we restored it. By that I mean we surveyed it, we looked for damaged parts of it, which we replaced. Uh, we stripped the paint down to bare metal, painted it back up again. So we essentially rebuilt that artifact. Now at the same time, everything we took off of it, the original pieces, we put in storage. We don't throw that stuff away. So restoration, including restoration on helmets, it's some pretty drastic stuff. But the middle ground is called conservation. It's a hands-on process, but it's not as, uh, it's not as high impact as restoration is. In conservation, you clean, you repair, you stabilize. Simple stuff. Now, the materials you need for conservation are pretty straightforward, and most of them you've got lying around the house. We'll start with that nice terry cloth towel, piece of old t-shirt, and you've all got those lying around, an assortment of brushes, toothbrush, watercolor brush, cosmetics brush, nice and soft, and uh, one of the things you use for removing rust and mold are erasers. Here's a nice vinyl eraser. And this is an artist's kneaded eraser. Pretty cool stuff. The thing about a kneaded eraser is it doesn't leave those little eraser crumbs behind, those little particles of rubber. This leaves nothing behind. It picks up everything. When it gets dirty, you just stretch it to find a clean surface. These are great things. Now, if you're doing repairs, you might need uh, you scissors, piece of archival acid-free paper. This is Arches watercolor paper. A couple uh, paper clips to use as clamps. 
some masking tape, and some, believe it or not, good old wood glue, okay? Elmer's glue, by the way, is archival. It's acid-free. It's what's used in the industry because it's reversible. It's water-soluble. And the final thing, you'll need this, is something called microcrystalline wax. That's what it looks like right there, microcrystalline wax. Now this brand is uh, called Renaissance Wax. This is what we used both uh, at the museum and when I was working at Antietam. Real good stuff, you can get it on Amazon. So these are the basic tools. So let's start with this nice uh, M40 German single decal helmet. Say this just came into the collection. First thing I do is survey it. I look for grime, I look for rust, I look for mold. I see what this helmet needs done. Now sometimes all you have to do is give it a nice dusting and put it on the wall and you're good to go. But other times you have things like rust and mold which will continue to damage this helmet. So you want to deal with those right away. So first things first, we dust it off. And guys, this is why we hang on to our old t-shirts, okay? Give it a nice overall dusting. Then you want to get the crud off, the grime and dirt. Now I'm going to pause for just a second. There are a lot of collectors, when they get a helmet in, they want to keep all the dirt and mud and stuff like that on it because they feel that's part of the helmet's history. And they're absolutely right. Remember, it's your helmet. Again, you can keep it however you want. I take that stuff off my helmets as much as I can simply because dirt and grime and rust will continue to damage your helmet. Dust and grime are very abrasive. Uh, dirt retains moisture, attracts moisture. As I said, it's abrasive. So I feel it's better to um, clean that stuff off. So the first thing I do is I look for active rust on the helmet. When I find it, I go over it first with, hey, look at that, toothbrush, simple stuff. I scrub at the rust. Now, this will take off a lot of the rust and it won't damage the paint at all. Now I've got the, ru the rust in a position where I can brush it off. Then I take a nice dish towel or washcloth. I'll get it a little damp, not wet, just damp. And then I'll give the helmet a nice once over, getting all that dirt and crud off and the remnants of that rust. I look at it, yeah, it's pretty gross. Take the clean side, I go back over it again, looking a little better. Get another clean surface, go and so on and so on until that towel comes away clean. Now you've got a clean helmet. What have we dealt with so far? The rust, the grime, and now we're going to tackle the mold. For the mold demo, I'm switching over to this Dutch M53 that I got in fairly recently, and it really needs some work, especially regarding mold. So this will be the specimen that I use to give the demonstration on dealing with mold. Pretty common now to have mold on your leather, in this case the headband of this Dutch liner. So the first thing I'm going to do is give it a light brush off so I can see what I'm doing. Hey look, the owner's name is down there. That took, that right there took off some of the surface mold. Now we get into the heavy duty stuff and I'm going to use this kneaded eraser. See what that does for us. Holy cow, look at that. It has, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that has gotten rid of 
the surface mold. Now there is still mold down in the pores of the leather, but we've got everything off the surface. Look how distinct this name is now. So that works really good. But to keep it from getting moldy again, this is super important. If you want to keep your collection from getting moldy, you need to have a dehumidifier. Run a dehumidifier all the time, sucks the moisture out of the air, and you won't have to worry about mold again. I really can't overstate the importance of a dehumidifier. Now, that's dealing with the mold, and you see it's fairly simple. A lot of people will say that uh, you can use bleach, ammonia, Clorox, Lysol, well, that will kill the surface mold, but it will also lead to the destruction of the leather. So you don't want to use that stuff, okay? It's as simple as cleaning it off the surface and keeping it in a dehumidified environment. Simple as that. Now, another thing about leather, and I'll probably get some pushback on this. Once leather becomes dried, cracked, and perished, there is nothing you can do to bring it back. Nothing. There are all kinds of products, oils and dressings out there specifically for leather that claim to rejuvenate it, to refurbish it, to restore it. Those things may make the leather look a little bit better, you know, initially. But that stuff all reacts with the leather, and it, all it will do is further degrade and destroy that leather. So stay away from it. If you get a helmet in and the leather's in good condition, condition give it a once-over with some Renaissance wax, and you're good to do, good to go. But don't use those restoratives because they're, in the long run, very damaging. Now that we've conquered mold, I'll show you another substance that you'll frequently find blooming uh, where the leather on your typically chin straps interacts with copper rivets. And that's called verdigris, that waxy green substance that is formed when there's a reaction between the acetic acid used to tan the leather and the copper rivet. Very easy to deal with. Let's take a look. Here's the garter end of uh, Euroclone M1 style liner chin strap. And you can see that green waxy deposit on the copper where it meets with the uh, leather. It's pretty easy to deal with. You'll find it a lot. Now, eventually, uh, this verdigris will harm the copper. All right, so you do want to get rid of it but it's pretty slow working. I'm gonna take the uh, toothpick. Look at that, it comes right off. Comes right off. And the toothpick, because it's soft wood, doesn't mar the leather or the metal. That's gotten a lot of it off just in one brush here. Looking much better much much better now i'll take a nice clean cloth give it a little bit of a rub down it appears that i've gotten almost all of it off so you see verdigris is very easy to deal with okay let's take a look at the application of this microcrystalline wax i'm going to try it out on this nice fj helmet my wife got this for me for my birthday a few years ago. It was a total surprise. I didn't even ask for it. What a gal. Everybody should have a wife like me. You just take a little dab of that wax onto the cloth and start wiping it on. A very thin, thin coat. Now, the beauty of the wax is it does not soak into the surfaces of things. It just rests on the top. And what that does, it provides a protective barrier against moisture. It also makes it easier to clean, easier to dust, 
And again, it is completely inert, non-reactive, and archival. So in addition to being good on the metal helmets, the microcrystalline wax is also good on the leather helmets. I have this wonderful old pickle hub that I picked up many years ago, and fortunately it had no um, mold on it at all. Now I've dusted it off, it's ready to go. I've got some wax on my uh, cloth, and I will start just applying it. Simple as that. And what that is doing is providing a nice, protective, non-reactive overcoating to the leather. It'll protect it, make it easier to keep clean. It's wonderful stuff. Super easy to use. Totally kind to your artifacts. So that's micro crystalline wax. Okay, so now we've talked about gentle cleaning uh, in the process of conserving your helmet. Now let's look a little bit at repair. Um, original objects can be repaired if you do it in a way that's uh, reversible and if you use non-reactive materials for the repair. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the leather liner chin strap on an M1 helmet. These are frequently broken and as age goes by, they're very lightweight leather. Uh, they will frequently break right in your hands, but there is a way to archivally repair these, to conserve these. Let's take a look. Okay, let's deal with that broken chin strap, the heartbreak of the broken liner chin strap. Now, this is a fragment of a liner chin strap that I saved, and I'm glad I did because now I can use it in this demonstration. I cut it in two pieces to simulate our break. Now, let's repair it. Take a piece of masking tape, align the two pieces carefully, press it down, okay, that's not going anywhere now. The next thing you do is you take some white glue, believe it or not, Elmer's glue is archival. It's non-reactive and, as all things in conservation should be, it's reversible. That is to say, at least in a museum setting, if a better material comes along down the road, this material can be removed and then the better technique can be employed. That makes sense. So I'm putting this white glue on the two pieces. Now I take um, a piece of acid-free paper and what I like to use is arches paper. It's a French watercolor paper. It's wonderful because it's strong. It's, it's sturdy. Uh, it's acid-free and it's treated with calcium carbonate. And what that does is it helps uh, neutralize the acids, the environmental acids that are in the air we're breathing. So it helps preserve in that manner too. So I, what I'm doing essentially is I'm just making a splint, a little splint to hold the two edges together. Now, when I get that done, then I like to take some of these paper clips and let me get this out of the way. Let me fold this back. I like to use the paper clip as a clamp. Just like in woodworking, if we clamp the glue, we're going to get a real good bond. And then I'll just let that set overnight. And that's all it takes. I used that same technique to repair this broken chin strap on my M40. I'll show you on the back here. 
There's the little paper splint, which I've painted a shade of brown just to help it blend in a little bit. I used acrylic paint, and the cool thing about acrylic paint is that it is archival. It's acid-free and non-reactive. Now, beyond mold and verdigris, there's something else that can damage your helmets, and it's something that you have complete control over. And that is the way you display or store your helmets. Don't stack your helmets. When you stack your helmets, what you're doing is you're damaging the finish, and you're also putting undue wear and tear on your liners. So try not to stack your helmets. If you've, if you've got to stack them, maybe that means you've got too many helmets. So there's my take on the, the basics of artifact or helmet uh, conservation. You see, it's really simple, common sense stuff. Again, this is how I do it. You might develop your own system. Mine is based upon my career in the museum biz. And again, you might come up with your own system. Now, I hope I didn't come across as a know-it-all because I gear these videos, all my videos, towards the newcomers, the helmet novices. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just an informed amateur myself, okay? I'm not an expert. So I hope it's been helpful. Um, if you want to see more of my uh, helmet-related stuff, you can search my videos. I'll have the link to my blog down in the description. And I guess that's it for this time. I've got a couple more videos in the works. One is about German helmets of World War I, and the other is going to be about uh, research materials for helmets that are available. And I hope it's more interesting than that description just sounded. So, until we meet again, uh, keep collecting, stay healthy, and remember this is a hobby. And hobbies are for having fun, so... Keep having fun. I'll see you next time.